This is what's happening. He's healing on the Sabbath. He's upsetting some people. We talked about this, this tension that's growing. He heals once again. They're scheming and they're plotting. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 15, but Jesus knew what they were planning. So he left that area and many people followed him. He healed all the sick among them and warned them not to reveal who he was. Join me in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord. Father, I pray you'd give me the very words to say this morning, Lord. Speak to, through me, Lord, to your people. Help us to see what it is you'd have us to see. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus knew what they were planning, the Bible says. What we see in the previous passage is that Jesus, Jesus confronted the Pharisees. He confronted them and their religious thinking, the way they thought. He, said, he continued to come to them. He's explaining to them what the Sabbath was created for. And what's happening is, is he's, he's stirring the pot here and people are starting to get upset. So the Bible says that Jesus knew what they were planning, so he had left the area. Jesus left the temple area because he didn't want to cause more confrontation. He says, you know, maybe I should just leave. So he just up and left. And you say, oh, okay, what does that mean? Well, but as he leaves, the Bible says he healed all the sick among them, yet he warned them not to reveal who he was. This bothered me all the time. Every time I read the passages, I always wondered, why did Jesus say, hey, he tell, you know, hey, you're healed, but don't tell nobody. Just go about your business, present the sacrifices, you know, the, uh, and just present the offering and, and just go about your business. And he constantly told people, don't tell, don't say nothing. I always wonder, why did he do that? And I've come to the realistic conclusion, there was, there was a few, and I'll get into the second part. The first part's easier. He didn't want people following him for the wrong reasons. See, I have a sister, and I'm wearing my pink. Anybody know why? Yep. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I used to wear pink all the time, even before my sister was diagnosed with it. And so my sister was diagnosed with it, and I said, you know what, now Breast Cancer Awareness Month just even a little more special to me. She's the only family member that I had who had it, and she's on the other side of it, praise God, amen? amen. <laughs> so I could go to somebody and say, listen, Jesus healed my sister. And somebody says, really? Well, my grandma's got cancer. Maybe I'll come to Jesus, he can get rid of her cancer too. Is that a reason to come to Christ? No. It's not. So people are coming to Jesus for what they can get out of him. Right. Guess what, church? It's still the same today. Yeah. Sure. They wanted physical healing. Heal my crippled hand or heal my, heal my financial situation, whatever. They wanted physical healing. They didn't really think or care about the spiritual. And the Bible says that we are spiritual beings. Amen? Amen. We will live forever. Once we die, I'm reading this book. Oh, my goodness, it's incredible. It's, just the, it's the gift of death. The, the, the death allows you to step into eternity. It's a doorway. We should not look at it as something that's so horrible. I shared with uh, Brother Solomon and I have had conversations before, and I said something along the lines like, you know, hey, you know, another day we're alive, it's all good. He said, I don't know, Pastor. <laughs> it's got to be pretty darn good on the other side. Yes. Yeah. Amen? Right. He said it a million times, and I look at him like, seriously, he ain't messing around. He's ready to go. And we say that too, oh yeah, we believe heaven's a beautiful place, we just ain't ready to go today. So if you come to Jesus for what you can get out of him, that's the wrong reason to come. We will live forever. The reason you should come to Jesus Christ is you recognize your sinfulness. You know you need a savior. You're going to burn in a hell that was never created for you if you don't repent of your sins and receive his forgiveness. That's what the Bible teaches. So Jesus didn't want people flocking to him. Hey, I got an uncle who can't see, he's blind. I got a sister who can't hear. She's deaf. Jesus, do a magic trick. Make a scene. We've seen you do it before. Do it again. Come on. Do it again. I think that movie, The Lion King. Remember that? The little cub. He was still a little cub. Still was a little cub. And the hyenas were messing with him. And he goes, he musters up the best growl he can get. And he goes, rah, rah. It's a little kitty growl. And they just cracked up laughing at him. The hyenas did. And then they elbow each other. They said, do it again. Do it again. They were laughing at him. Do it again. They wanted to see it. It was just so entertaining for them. Well, what they didn't know was his big Musafa, the king, his dad was behind him, and he let out a real ground, scared the mess out of him. <laughs> the point is, do it again. Do it again. That's what the crowd was doing following Jesus. And so Jesus said, look, don't tell nobody. I don't need a bigger circus. Church, look around you. The church today is not much different than it was then. 
You see people flocking to Jesus Christ for all the wrong reasons. They want to see the next magician. They want to see the next magic trick. They think that they can manipulate God. If you pray to God, he's some cosmic magician. If you pray to him, you can get him to reveal his tricks. Pull a rabbit out of a hat, God. Ta-da! That's what the world does today. The true followers of Jesus Christ, we follow with or without the miracles. And we're going to get into something just in a little bit here. But this is what Jesus was saying. Don't tell everybody. I don't need a, a, a sideshow. Second one is because he didn't want to promote misconceptions. He didn't want people to have this false hope. I picture this. I used to think of Jesus and his 12 disciples. The Bible often uses the word disciples and apostles uh, interchangeably. But the truth is those are two different people. Disciples can be apostles, but not all disciples are apostles. Amen? But all apostles are typically disciples. Now, an apostle is somebody who's sent by Jesus Christ to do the work. So here we have, the Bible says in verse 17, it says, this fulfilled, he says, he warned people, don't tell everybody, don't say nothing. Verse 17 says, this fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Look at my servant, the scripture says, whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious and his name will be the hope of all the world. This is the prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. This is the, the, the Messiah who is to come. Clearly, the Messiah is to be king. But the kind of king they wanted, they wanted a, a military and political leader. I was a kid, I used to watch, my mom and dad used to watch these, these religious TV shows, like the Ten Commandments. And I used to watch, you know, when they'd have, they'd have a show of Jesus and he died on a cross, he had a little trickle of blood, a little, little puncture wound on the side. That was not at all how it happened. But I used to watch these shows when I was a kid, and I never really thought much of it, because they always did a horrible job of painting a picture, that's why. But when you start watching some of the more updated shows, like The Passion of the Christ, for example, there were a lot of people who were stirred and moved by Jesus. His mere presence brought a crowd. Now, I'm a policeman. You know what? I don't like watching five and six dudes walk down the street at a time. I don't. Where are they going? And what are they up to? Especially if they're not wearing suits. Britches are sagging. <laughs> Pants, hat, hat, hat tipped to the side, just strolling down the street, smoking and joking. You like that, Vern? You like rolling up on guys like that? Yeah. You really don't. You're looking at them and you just don't drive past them. You look and you're like, what are they up to? They might not be up to anything. Maybe they want to play basketball, but they don't look like it because you don't see a ball. Okay? So you don't like that crowd thing. It's just, it makes people uneasy. You think the old lady is going to go throw out her garbage? It's about five o'clock in the wintertime and it gets dark early. She's about to throw out her garbage and she looks in the alley and she sees five knuckleheads hanging around smoking, talking in the alley. They're just talking. Maybe they're going to go Ice skating, I don't know. <laughs> but she looks out and she sees these five dudes and she says, you know what, I'll wait till the sun comes up tomorrow and I'll throw out my garbage in the morning. Makes people nervous. Yep. Jesus had 12 disciples walking around. You know what that looks like? Yeah. A gang. Looks like a mob. A, a posse. <laughs> it looks like a, he's rolling deep. <laughs> Think about that. They didn't like that. And then the 12 drew more people. The Bible over and over describes these crowds of people. Now the crowds of people say, go Jesus, go Jesus, go. Remember that? I said the fan of Jesus Christ, they're fans. Woohoo! Let's overthrow this government. We got a leader now. The Messiah's here. That was not the military. That's not the leader. Who's, that's not what the Messiah was supposed to be. According to Isaiah, it says, my servant whom I have chosen is my beloved. He will please me. I will put my spirit upon him. He will proclaim justice to the nations. Yeah, that means overthrowing governments. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public and will not crush the weakest reed. That sound like a military overthrow? Not even close. But the people don't want to hear that. They want to hear what they want to hear. And they were catapulting Jesus to be the God or the Messiah that they wanted him to be. Interesting enough, church, we do the same thing. We want a cosmic magician that we can call on. We want an automatic prayer machine that we can just pray up and God's going to move. It don't work that way, church. We, promote, we, we create God in our own image. We create the God we like, the God we want. We don't want the full counsel of God. Read your Old Testament. You'll shudder. Oh, yeah. 
when you see what kind of God we serve. You're like, I'm telling you, if you're not familiar with it, you'll be shocked. But we've created God in our own image, in our own likeness. We want a God that suits our needs. We want the buffet God where we could take more and mashed potatoes and double meat and leave the corn. It doesn't work that way, church. You get all of them or you don't get any of them. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Amen? And so what this, Jesus was saying, look, don't go out telling everybody I don't need this thing to grow. They already think I'm going to be the king and overthrow the Roman government, and that is not why I'm here. That's what he's saying. So as you examine that, Jesus moves from there. The Bible says he moved there. He, he left the temple because they were going to kill him, but they were plotting to kill him. He leaves, and he's healing people on his way out, and he's telling people don't say nothing, and this is why. Okay? So now you see the next event in Jesus' life is he chooses the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles. I want to spend a little time here. You know, just back to drawing the picture of the God that we want, um, Brother Nick gave me a book that I was reading. I shared this with you with a little boy who was actually drawing a picture of God, the father. And the man asked him, hey, what are you drawing? So I'm drawing a picture of God. He says, you can't do that. He tells the kid. I don't know why an adult would tell a kid that. Hey, you can't do that. Nobody knows what he looks like. And the kid says, they will when I'm done with him. <laughs> He's drawing a picture of God. This is what God looks like to this kid. And we do the same thing, church. This is what God looks like. You better read your Bible to see what he looks like. Okay, because he is definitely perfect in every way and is not what you created him to be. And people are following him from all the wrong reasons and people still do the same today. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Our lives are cyclic. It comes back around. We do the same thing they did 2,000 years ago. Now, as Jesus leaves, he chooses 12 disciples. Um, and these 12 disciples, now think about this. If this is true with the people who are following do you think it's probably true? Remember the law of attraction I talked about last week? Do you remember that? I said, if we, tr if, we, if we start a church, this is true. This is a biblical truth. It is true in church plants. And it's absolutely true in the secular world in which we live in, the non-religious world in which we live in. We draw people who are similar to us. If you're a smoker, you probably hang around smokers. If you're a drinker, you'll probably attract drinkers. If you are a hell raiser, that's what you're going to attract in your life. If you're a liar, these are the kinds of people, birds of a feather flock together. Amen? They do. And people are, oh, it's not true. And the church is true. If we have a church of 20, we start a church, 20 people, and all 20 of us are immature Christians, one foot in the world, one foot in the church, guess what we're going to draw? Guess what the next 100 people through the door will be? Just like us. 20 lazy people who don't want to do nothing. Guess what? The next 100 we draw through the door will be just like us. 20 of us who don't read our Bibles, guess what? The next 100 we draw will be just like us. It's the law of attraction. It's true. It's real. So here's the question. If the crowds were following Jesus were under this misconception of who he was, do you think it's possible that the 12 inner circle the apostles were under the same misconception? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Jesus spends a lot of time investing in those 12, teaching them, telling them, hey, look, I need to show you what the truth is. So as we look at that, I want you to think about these 12 that Jesus draws. In Luke, if you go to Luke, Nick, I don't know if you can pull it up quick enough, but we're in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. I want to show you something, and I don't normally skip back and forth because I don't like you skipping all the way around, but in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 says, one day soon afterward, that means right in close proximity after Jesus left the temple and everybody was mad at him, and he left and he was healing diseases and he was, he was uh, people, and he was telling people not to say nothing, one day soon after that, might have been a Monday or Tuesday, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. I'm reading out of the NLT. Somebody have a different translation? Matt, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Anyone? Go ahead, Manny. Any different? Anybody? What translation is that, Manny? Revised standard. Anybody got a different translation? Frank, read yours. The message. Read it. It says, about that, about that same time he climbed a mountain to pray. He was there all night in prayer before God. Okay, so consistent in all three translations, he's all night. Bob, what translation you have? Go ahead, read it. At that time, he just went up a hill, prayed, and spent the whole night there praying to God. 
All right, well, he shrunk the mountain to a hill, but nonetheless, he stayed up there all night. Amen? All right. So we do know that Jesus prayed all night long. Amen? At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. He called all of his disciples together and chose 12 of them to be apostles. In Mark, the scripture reads, after Jesus had went up on the mountain, he called out with ones that he wanted to go with him, same parallel passage, and they came to him, and he appointed them, 12 of them, to, and called them apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. Here are their names. <clears throat> The crowd is following Jesus. They have this wrong expectation of him. It's highly likely that his apostles had the same wrong expectation of him. And as Jesus calls out the 12, what do you think the temptation of them? I, they, my brother-in-law was in the army. <laughs> and before I was ready to join, I was, he, joined, he like served 10 years before me. And I was ready to join the army. He tells me, listen, I can give you any advice. He said, keep your mouth shut and your ears open. I said, got it. And he says, and one more thing. Don't volunteer. <laughs> Say that again, Frank. Don't volunteer. Don't volunteer for nothing. <laughs> nothing. All right, that's a military thing. You don't volunteer. You don't volunteer. <laughs> you know, you're, you're stuck in this base. You can't do nothing. Can't go nowhere. And like, hey, who, who's got a driver's license? I'm like, me. Me. I got a license. Good. You think you're going to jump in a car and drive somewhere, right? I'm thinking, yeah. What do you need a license for? To drive. I'm thinking, yeah. You can't drive in circles. We're leaving the post. Yeah. I'm going to break away from all these knuckleheads. I was picked. He goes, you. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. You know, I come over there. What do you need, Drill Starting? He hands me a rake. Drive that rake over there and rake up all those leaves. I'm like, seriously? And he's like, you think I'm kidding? And I'm like, dang it. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, Rob told me, don't volunteer for nothing. I'm like, man, it, you just want. I'm picked. There's 200 guys in my company. There's, there's 50 guys in my platoon alone, and I got picked. Well, then the sad reality is I got picked to go rake leaves. You see, the apostles, when Jesus called them out, those 12, you think they were like, yeah. Seriously, there's a crowd of people. Jesus picks 12 of them. What do you think the opportunity for them to be called by Jesus was like? I got called and you guys didn't. Ha ha. Yeah. Pride. I'm, Jesus, this crowd that's following Jesus gives them an opportunity to be prestigious. People get to see them. They're going to know, man, I was a nobody. Now I'm somebody. You see the difference? So Jesus calls these 12, and I'm just imagining these 12. Jesus is like, mm, Frank, uh, Anthony. And I see Gary in the back, pick me, Jesus, pick me, pick me. And he goes, mm, Nacho. And Rob's like, no, don't pick me. I don't know what's going on. I don't volunteer for nothing. And he goes, Rob. And Rob's like, doggone it. Oh, you know, but they're coming out. He's calling them out. Some of them are. Got, you got to be, you got to believe that this popularity that's growing and this fanfare that's growing and the sideshow that's happening, you got to believe these 12 thought something great was going to happen, something good, that they had to get something out of this. Wouldn't you think? And they did. They did. But their blessing was spiritual far beyond what they would have ever imagined. Amen? Misconceptions. Who is this Jesus and what's he going to do for me? Well, you're serving him for the wrong reasons if that's your attitude. But I want to examine these 12. The Bible says, he gave the 12, he, these are the 12 he chose. Simon, who was named Peter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee. He nicknames them son, sons of thunder. That's because they were passive. I got like two chuckles, really? They were passive, sons of thunder, come on. All right. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, last but not least, actually is the least, is uh, Iscariot, who would later betray him. Interesting enough that Jesus Christ would pick the very guy who's going to betray him. Um. Here's what I want you to do. I'm, I have this thing. I was going to print it out for you, but I didn't want to lose you. I'd rather speak and then just hold your attention. But first of all, Jesus prayed all night. When's the last time you did that? Well, Jesus. I'm not talking about some riffraff 
who just got arrested and was gonna, is probably going to get the death penalty. Now he's crying out to God, save me, Lord. And he's crying. I'm not talking about that guy because that makes sense. I can understand why that guy would pray all night. Maybe you've been in a similar situation in your life where I mean, the wheels fell off and you you're just totally don't know what to do and you just pray, 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 pray. But when's the last time you prayed all night? This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, prays all night before he selects his 12. Eleven were good choices, presumably, and one was not. Well, Jesus failed in prayer. He should have prayed two nights. No. But here's what I want you to think about. These disciples, if you examine Jesus' life, before every major and significant event, he prayed. He prayed. Church, we put it on the board up here, this, uh, the overhead this morning, that we want to be a house of prayer. Well, you can't do that without praying. I'll pray for you, brother. Thank you. We want to be a house of prayer. It's our first core value. I'll pray for you, brother. And I really mean to, but I'm driving. So I'm going to pray for him when I get home. And I get home, and Tina tells me, the toilet's overflowing. Now I'm over here pumping the toilet, trying to get to go down, and I forgot all about praying in this prayer. How many times have you done that one? We well, say, I'm going to pray for you. Offer up a prayer right now. It's not going to hurt you. You don't have to be in your prayer closet. You don't have to be on your knees. You can pray with both eyes open as you're driving. Amen? Amen. But we don't pray, for church. We don't pray. Not like this. But Jesus prayed constantly, consistently before every major event. And even when there was something significantly major going on, he prayed anyway. But when he picks these 12, they couldn't be any more different. Look around the church. Look around you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take a look around. Turn your head around. I'm giving you permission. You got to own be a distraction. I'm telling you, turn around. Take a look. Does everybody look the same? Not even close. Not even close. Some of us look the same. We got siblings. Me and Candida couldn't be more to say. I mean, when she got her hair cut, when her hair got shaved down, I was like, man, we look a lot alike. She's still pretty. Uh, I hope so. I wouldn't want the word pretty, the adjective, you know, described to me. But, uh, but anyway, it's funny because we do, some of us do look alike, but many of us are very, 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 very different. When I met Brother Frank and Sinez, I couldn't, I couldn't believe how different we were. And then you know, he's Hispanic. Yeah, but he's Mexican. But you're married to a Mexican. Well, they're still we're different. We're not the same. Well, you guys look the same, but we're not. The way he thought, the way he acted, just everything about him. He was a mill rat. I was a policeman. I mean, we just couldn't be any more different. And then finally, I found there's some similarities. There was some, there was some commonality we had. And one of the main thing we had in common was Jesus Christ. Okay, and we built upon that. Everything else worked itself out. I even went golfing with him. Can you believe it? Twice. Three times. I golf with him three times. And I don't golf. Ask him. He'll tell you. I'm taking chunks out the grass. <laughs> he like, but anyway. You know, the point is you look around, you see differences. We're very, very different. The apostles were no different. They were different as well. They were very diverse. They were not the same. They were different. Very different. Now, you can, you can bond together on the common ground that you have, or you can divide. It's up to you. Amen. You can come together and say, hey, we are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though I don't like him because he's Mexican, <laughs> I'm married to a Mexican. That's why I'm using that illustration. You're like, ooh, he racist. No, my wife's Mexican. <laughs> but because Frank is Mexican, you know, I, you, oh, they don't get along. It, nonsense. Nonsense. Amen? Amen? They got along just fine, those 12. And you see they have pockets where they didn't get along so great, but we'll get into all that later. But these 12 are different. And it, they're different for a reason. If we were all the same, we couldn't reach anybody. We could only reach the same kind of people. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, those of you who didn't know me before I was a Christian, I was a very aggressive man, very aggressive. And uh, parts of that's part of my personality, and a lot of that's still the same, you know, but it's God has kind of bridled that a little bit, praise God. The Holy Spirit said, hey, Jose, chill. So then I go to the last church where we had a gym, basketball gym. I share this story. I'm going at it. I'm going at it. So I get on the court, and Tina tells me before I leave, she goes, hey, Jose. <laughs> she goes, remember my aunt goes there. My family goes to this church. Don't embarrass me. Because I'm playing pickup games at the park, and you're like slapping hands, way pulling up the jump shot. Ah! In your face. Oh! You know, that's how we play ball on the streets, you know. Get off me. Pushing, shoving, holding on to each other's shorts so you can't break. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Cheat. That's how you play. No blood, no foul. You know, that's how we play. Am I right, Rob? Oh, yeah. Gorilla ball is what we call it. Prison ball. 
So Tina knows I'm an unbridled maniac. And of course she says, dude, don't go to this church and embarrass me. They're Christians. <laughs> and I'm like, so my perception of Christians were this meek and mild and humble and quiet, which we should be, amen? <laughs> which we should be. I get on the basketball court, my pastor's there. I'm like, what? Pastor plays ball? I grew up in a Catholic church. Where he, <laughs> you never see the, the priest do anything except, you know, walk in all smooth and glide out, you know. You never, you know, the, the priest playing basketball? Not going to happen. Not in the Catholic church. I never thought I'd see that. And my pastor was good. He was a baller. And he'd give you the ooh. You know, and I'm like, dang, dude, you can't do that. You're a pastor. <laughs> you know, hard fouls and everything. And then uh, two brothers, uh, very aggressive ball players. I'm just going to tell you, it was Frank and Frank. I'm telling. I'm telling. They got into this heated debate, and it was over, it was over Frank's old, uh, oldest son. Frank wanted him to be a little hard. Get in the paint, man. Get in the paint. And Frank's like, hey, could you all have my son? And I'm like, yeah, baby. We're in the park now, and we're in the gym. You know, and I'm watching this thing transpire, and, and they, were, they were mad at each other. <laughs> they were genuinely mad at each other, just like basketball gets heated. And uh, Tony was there. Almost positive you were there. And so anyway, we're all, I'm, I'm like, I'm a policeman. I'm thinking, I hope these guys don't start fighting. You know, because I'm going to have to, like, do something. And I'm like, I'm getting out of here before it gets to that. And so my pastor, he's sitting on the side, sipping on water. I'm like, you're going to, what, you know. Anyway, and I'm like, now I'm thinking, yeah. Because I know it's just a matter of time before I blow a gasket. Because I was crazy. And so if I blow a gasket, I ain't the first one who did it. All right? So they're going to have to forgive me if they forgive each other. You know? And it's not okay. It's not okay. But it's understandable. That was on a Saturday. The next Sunday, I come to church. And uh, Brother Frank's banging the keys, playing the piano. And Brother Frank, he comes up there, and they, they shake hands, they hug. And I'm like, wow, it's just a game. They got heated. It was no hard feelings. It wasn't personal. It was nothing like that. And I thought to myself, man, God revealed to me something. Some people say, that would have scared me away. I would have never went back to that church. That's probably true for you. But for me, that's what I needed. I needed to know these guys weren't perfect. They weren't pretending to be somebody that they weren't. They were men who loved God, and they had flaws like anybody else. And they got away from them. And they apologized. They moved past that big deal. And they're still friends today. It is what it is. My point is, I saw something in common. I said, wow, as much as I thought we were different, I've seen a whole lot of similarities between us, the three of us, and others. I can rattle off a bunch of names of I thought my nature of being aggressive was so much a part of who I was, I didn't desire to change it. I didn't desire to change it. I didn't want to be the wimpy Christian. Well, slap one cheek, turn the other. That ain't me. Well, you allow, the, you allow the Spirit of God to work in your life, and he'll change you into who he wants you to be. But your personality is very unique. God created you with that personality for a reason. He's not trying to change it. He wants you to rechannel it. Harness it. Don't let it get away from you. And these apostles that he chose were very different in a lot of ways. And none of them were exactly the same. But here's the thing I want you to see. Simon Peter, the Bible shows him to be impulsive. <laughs> in the garden, he whips out a sword and chops off somebody's ear. Don't, no questions asked. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, hey, you know, uh, you guys will betray me. And Peter's like, never, Lord, not me. You know, even if everybody goes and falls away and everybody, I'm not leaving you, Lord. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Peter's like, who are you talking to? Peter was quick to open his mouth. Peter was quick to wield the sword. Peter, man, I imagine, I imagine a big dude, Peter. I imagine a guy who had no problems putting his fist in your face. That's who I see. Very impulsive, very passionate. James, he's a fisherman. Peter was a fisherman. Ambitious, James was, yet he was short-tempered and very judgmental. You can examine this. I can go back and pull the passages for the sake of time. I won't. John was fisherman, ambitious and judgmental as well, but later becomes very loving, very gentle, and he also writes uh, the book of John and even Revelation. Andrew, Peter's brother, was a fisherman also and eager to bring others with him. That's a good quality to have. Check this out. Philip, fisherman, his attitude? Mm, nobody really knows. It's kind of questionable. Nathaniel, occupation unknown. Honest yet straightforward. Jesus calls him a true son of Israel. Matthew, despicable scumbag. He was tax collecting, cheating, no good, dirty dog. 
abandoned his corrupt and financial profitable job that he had to follow Jesus Christ. He was an outcast. He was a dishonest. He had a character. He had a reputation that was not good. Thomas, courageous, yet doubtful. James, the son of Alphaeus, what did he do for a living? Nobody knows. You know what his, character, uh, his characteristics were? Also unknown. Thaddeus, you know what his job was? Me neither. You know what his outstanding characteristics were? Nobody knows. The Bible never mentions it. Simon the Zealot, unknown. Fear of patriotism is his uh, characteristic. Judas Iscariot, unknown his profession. Treacherous and greedy. So what can we see here? Clearly distinct men, different, totally different in, every, in a lot of ways. But some, the Bible doesn't even mention them, what they did. did you, uh, how many disciples were there? People, oh, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, Mark, you know, and Luke weren't apostles, so you're, eh, wrong answer. Uh, it's four. No, there's not four. It's 12. Well, can you name them? Yeah, Peter, uh, James, and John. That was Jesus' inner circle. That's easy. Judith had no good, dirty scumbag. Who else? Oh, after that, kind of gets sketchy. Andrew, Nathaniel. That's because I just ran off the name. Bartholomew. You start rattling them off, man, but I'm telling you, you'll come up short. You'll miss them. You know why? Because the Bible doesn't speak much of them. They must be unimportant then, right? Absolutely not, church. People think that being out front, that, you, that the ministry, I call, I call brother Jason Casper the ghost. That's what I called him, Casper the Ghost. And not because he needs a suntan, but because he moves behind the scenes. Sorry, Jason. Jason moves behind the scenes. There's a lot of things that happen that you have no idea that Jason does. He tends to. And you know what? Jason isn't a glory hound. He ain't standing out front, look at me. Look at me. Yeah, you see that? I did that. Jason don't do that. And some of the most Important job. I'll tell you another ghost. You probably don't know his brother George. He don't, first of all, he don't talk much. People are like, does he talk? He talks. <laughs> He's just quiet. Yep. And his work is quiet. And he serves with humility. But he doesn't, he's not out front looking for the glory. And all of the apostles, all of them did not have this upfront responsibilities. And so what can we surmise? That the church today isn't much different? That it took, why did, he th why did he take 12? Why didn't he just take 10 since two of them aren't really anybody important? They are important. Just because the Bible doesn't record what they're doing doesn't mean it was insignificant. Amen? Amen. And who were they? They didn't get, you know, they're arguing later over who's going to be the greatest. But, but these 12, they're just obscure names that disappear into the pages of Scripture. And so they're unimportant? Of course not. They have a role, they had a responsibility that Jesus would have never called them in the first place. Amen? So you say, okay, well, what are you saying? Well, I'm glad you asked. What, are we, what should we be doing? A, we should be receptive to Jesus' call in our life. What has he called you to do? I can assure you he did not call you to come and keep that chair warm. That one right there. Keep it warm for me. I can assure you that's not what he's called you to do. Well, what has he called you to do? I'm not sure. But the apostles were sent, and their responsibility was to do something, not to sit. There's a time where they were listening. Hey, Nick, can you pull that back up, that slide up again? There's a time, uh, the core value slide. There's a time where the apostles were actually just disciples. They were listening. They were students. They were being taught. But the time has shifted now where he's going to teach them, and we're going to see the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to teach them. He's going to invest in them because he, he has a job for them to do. He builds this relationship with these apostles. They become disciples because they're following and he's teaching. But the transition shifts from being a disciple to becoming a leader. They have a responsibility now to go out and lead respectively. In their communities, we're talking about these concentric circles. I've got so many thoughts shooting through my head. But the point is, you can be effective in your realm, your sphere of influence. There's people you come into contact with. I am in contact with people, policemen, all day. On a different department than Brother Vern is. Frank. Manny, Jen, uh, Anthony, and Rob, they work in the mill. Yet, do your circles overlap, Rob's? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure your circles don't overlap his. Do your circles overlap his? No. Do your circles overlap his? No. Not even the same mill? The same mill? You and Anthony's circles overlap. 
But you see the point? You can be a leader. You can affect it. You know what the word, I whittle the word leadership down to one, one word, a one word definition for leadership, and it's influence. That's what it is. It's influence. You're influencing people, good or bad, folks. You're leading people one direction or the other. You're drawing them closer to the Lord or you're pushing them further away. And so Jesus picks these 12. So what does that look like for you? Jesus calls you. He calls you unto himself. First, he calls you into a relationship, salvation with him, a salvation relationship. He saves you from the punishment of your sins. But that's not it. Because if that's all he wanted from you, you'd be raptured and taken to heaven right here, right now. Nick, you saved, saved, gone to glory. Anthony, say, saved, gone to glory. If that's all he cared about was your immortal soul, we'd be gone. But he's left you here. There's a song we used to sing that, uh, and I can't, uh, oh, I remember it. I sang it before. And it says, uh, there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, holy one. Thank you, oh, my father, for giving us your son and leaving us your spirit here till work on earth is done. Mm -hmm. That's why you're here. There's work to do. And he's left you the spirit of God to actually help you through that process. But that's why you're still here. So if he's called you into a relationship with him, it's not, that's, that's chapter one. There's more to come. You need to develop in your relationship with God, and, by, and we develop by serving him. You say, well, how do I serve him? Well, you have to grow and figure that out. God will reveal that to you, but you've got to be serious about that. Christy, my daughter, when she was, um, played softball, she was a beast. Kid, man, she wanted to win. I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> but she said, hey, if we can't win, ain't no point in playing. That's my girl. So what happens is we go out, and one day she's little. She said, I want to pitch. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, man, you know the weight of the world is on the pitcher's shoulders. She's like, six? Like, you can't pitch. I don't think she can get the ball out from the mound to the plate. And she's like, I can do it, Dad. I can do it. They put her in. She didn't do too bad. I said, wow, I was kind of proud. Well, if you know my kid, she comes home and she's like, get your mitt, Dad. It's just begun. I'm like, oh, man. So we're out in the, in the yard and she's throwing pitches. She'd wear me out, man. She'd throw them all day long. I had to limit her. I said, look, you're going to get 100 pitches and we're going to break your arm. You know, you know, I'm using that as an excuse. I had other things to do. So I'd count her pitches, you know, and she said, no, you need to count strikes, Dad. They don't count unless they're strikes. I'm like, no, 100 pitches all you get. So then we'd go out to the park and we'd practice with the team. We'd practice for an hour, hour and a half. We'd come home, ha! I'd come home, shower up, and she'd like, get your mitt, Dad. She wanted to practice more. It wasn't enough. She wanted more. There wasn't enough. She wanted more. Consequently, she became a really good softball player. She bought, listen to me, church. She bought one of one I bought it. She made me buy it. Bought one of those swingaways. You know what that is? You put it on a pole and you hit it, and the ball goes around like that, and then it comes back around, and then you, you practice your swing. She's out there. So I get 100 pitches with her, and I go inside, and I hear. Yeah, I mean, all the time. And she's always practicing. I'm like, kid. Yeah. That's the kind of effort we put into things that we like and important to us. Brother Luke, was, uh, we were at a birthday party yesterday, and he says, he bowls. And he says, uh, the season, how, how long did you say it was? Uh, 33 weeks of bowling season. <laughs> 33 weeks. That's some bowling. You know what? Luke's pretty good. Amen. He spends a lot of time bowling. He's got some real pretty shoes. He's got this real cool approach, you know. You, you know, when you bowl with Luke, you know, he put the time in. We don't put that kind of time into our relationship with God. And I'm not calling Luke or Christy. I'm talking about we, church. Those are examples. We don't put that kind of relationship with God. How long does it take you to bowl? Uh, uh, what, how long is the night of bowling? Luke, three hours? Yeah. You know, when this, today's over, I'm going home to watch the Bears game. We're probably going to get beat up by the Raiders like we've done with every other team, but I'm going to watch it anyway. The, the blessing is that I got it recorded, so I'll be able to fast forward through all the painful parts. But I'm still going to watch it. Brother Ron tells me, Pastor, I couldn't be here for the last several weeks, but I watch it on the live stream. So he's putting forth the effort when he can't be here because of work or whatever the case may be. Do we put in that kind of effort? With our relationship with God, are we, are we making the time to read our Bibles? Are we making the time to pray? 
We see it in Jesus' life. He even considered that before he took his disciples. He takes those disciples, he appoints them apostles, and then he begins to teach them. And we're going to do this Sermon on the Mount, which I thought we were going to get into today. I'm going to briefly touch over it real quick, and I won't stay on it too long because we're running out of time. But you have a responsibility, church. If God has shown himself in your life at all, there's a responsibility for you in that to respond. Absolutely. So he picks these 12, the Bible says. And then the next event, after he picks these 12, the Bible says, one day he saw the crowds gathering. Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. He began to teach them. Somebody, this is Matthew chapter 5. Verses uh, 1 through 12 says, verses 1 and 2, somebody's, disciple, uh, somebody's translation read different. Mine says his disciples gathered around him in verse 1. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, verse 1. His disciples came to him, gathered around him, and he began to teach them. He began to teach them. Now, the inner 12 are his apostles, so they're probably sitting super close. Verse 3 says, these are the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude is a Latin term for uh, blessings. Okay, so you heard the Beatitudes, you heard uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, you heard all of this. So mine is an NLT translation, and perhaps you never heard it translated this way before, but Jesus says in verse 3, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. Somebody got a different translation? Read verse 2. Verse 3, sorry. Read the message. It says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. That's beautiful. Because you cannot believe, you, cannot, you can't do anything for yourself, you have to rely on God. The Bible says God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. You see what he's doing? He's teaching something very contrary to the earthly kingdom that they expected him to set up. He's teaching something very contrary to what the Pharisees were teaching. That, hey, you know, hey, you know, Jesus' disciples, the 12, when they were picked, those apostles, they were like, woohoo, what does this mean? And Jesus says God blesses those who are at the end of their rope. God blesses those who realize their need for him, he tells his disciples. Don't get it messed up. Don't think you're called into this place of power and prestige like the Pharisees do. You, Christian, God blesses you when you realize your need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, you can imagine that Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is near, and people are probably saying, well, how do I get into this kingdom? What do I got to do? How much do I got to pay? How long do I need to fast? And Jesus said, God blesses those who realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Verse 4, God blesses those who mourn because they will be com comforted. Verse 5, God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. They will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. This is my favorite one, church. This is why I'm merciful. People think I'm stupid. I ain't stupid. Okay, I allow people, I tolerate a lot of foolishness. When people get a, a lash out at me, I know what's going on. I'm not dumb. Okay? But I tolerate a lot. I show people mercy. You know what mercy is? There's no difference between God's mercy and God's grace. And I'll take God's mercy over his grace any day of the week and twice on Sundays, church. Because grace is when God gives you what you don't deserve. And that's the gift of salvation. I do appreciate that. Don't get me wrong. But mercy means he ought to wrap me right upside my head. And he don't. And I see God just pours his mercy out on Jose Burgos every day, and I'm so grateful for that. And the Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And I tolerate a lot of people's foolishness, even, even bad guys on the street, talking crazy to me. Oh, I'm going to kill your wife and kids. I know where you live. No, you don't, dude. And if you do, you know, I don't say that. That's what I want to say. Come on, boy, I'll be waiting for you. That's what I want to say in my flesh. I'm like, come on. That's what I want to say. I wish, you know, because you know, he's challenging me as a man. Show that man some mercy. He's talking because he's angry. I don't have a right to just thump him upside his head because he made me mad. None of us have a right to do that, yet we think we do. Somebody makes you angry on the street, you don't have to be a cop. You want to put your fist in your face. Amen. So we need to recognize that when we show people mercy, the Bible says, blessed are the merciful because we'll be shown mercy. I want God's mercy in my life. I want it bad. So I try to remember that when I deal with people. God has taught me that one a lot, of, a lot on that one through my own children. As a father who has a responsibility to correct his children and show, you know, teach them discipline, you also have to be merciful too. God blesses the pure at heart, 
for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it, Jesus says. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You know, um, and I believe that's true. And I'm blowing through this because it's late, and I'm going to touch on it next week when we come back. I will, I will unpack those verses a little more. But you clearly see by examining these verses that the kingdom of God is significantly different than an earthly kingdom. Amen? Those verses do not apply in an, organized, in an organization here on earth. No, 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 no. We don't play those games. We, we want to be harsh. We want to be. But the Bible clearly teaches those are two different kinds of kingdoms. Amen? And he's trying to tell his disciples, listen, if you're in this for, for this, you're in for the wrong reasons. This is what we ought to be. He's teaching them, the 12 up close, and those who are gathered on the mount, he's teaching them the Beatitudes, the blessings of God, fall on these types of people, not the opposite. And he says, the last verse, I'll go back, he says, blessed when people mock you, all sorts of evil things because they are my followers. Uh, the next verse, there was a verse that said, uh, because you're, what does it say, your inheritance in heaven? What did it see? How did it read? Be happy about it. Very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Now listen to this. <laughs> this is true, church. We say we want the blessings of God. That's what we say. Because that's because, again, we created God in our image and our likeness. And we believe God's blessings look like this. X, Y, and Z. But he says a great reward awaits you in heaven. I'm 40, I'll be 44 next week. If I live to be 80, I say 84 just for an even round number. If I live to be 84, I got 40 more years before I can receive my blessings in heaven. 40 years. Society don't work that way, church. We live in this instant gratification society. We want stuff now. Microwave ovens and fast food restaurants, it ain't quick enough. So when you're serving God, you want his blessings now. Yet I've known prayer warriors who've prayed for things for years, decades, and waited for God to move. God doesn't move when you tell him to. He moves according to his sovereign plan. Amen. Okay, and the blessings of God come. If we, if we line ourselves up with these Beatitudes, and I'll talk more about them next week. If you line yourself up more with these, the, 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 the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, then the blessings of God will follow, the Bible says. Now, you might not get them here on earth. You'll probably get them in heaven. You know, I look at my dad. He, my dad had a lot of stuff, garage full of stuff. You know, he had a house. And I look at all the stuff my dad had. I'm like 15, 16. I'm like, I want this. But I wanted it by the time I was 21. My dad worked his lifetime to get those things. But that's not what we want. We, as, in our society today, we, we want it now. And it ain't no different with God. We pray and we expect him to move. God, I, I said, I want you to do this, and you didn't move, so I'm mad at you. Forget you. And now you're back to the crowds that are following Jesus to see the next cosmic miracle from this magician. See, I have a friend of mine on the police department. He's a magician. His name is Steve Kellogg. That's for you, Steve. He's good. Really good. Claims to be an atheist. Sorry, Steve. I don't believe he is. Really good friend of mine. Love him to death, and we're really close. He, uh, but he's always Steve the magician. I look at him. I'm, I'm being honest, church. I, I see him at work, and he, he, I don't see a policeman. <laughs> I'm like, hey, let's do a magic trick. Do a magic <laughs> trick. Show me a magic trick. I'm telling you, he blew me away. Check this one out. True story. He had a deck of cards. And he pulls out a deck of cards and he opens them up. He pick a card, any card. And he says, don't tell me what it is. I pull it and it's, it's blank. And I hold it to him and it's blank. He goes, oh. So he holds them up over and they're all blank. There's nothing. They're white. He says, put it back in. I'm looking at him. I'm like, where's this going? He opens it up again. He says, pick a card. He says, think what card it is. Don't tell me. I pull the card out and I look at it. It's still white. The whole deck's white. I'm thinking, where's he going with this? He says, what? don't tell me the card. Don't tell me the card. And I'm thinking in my head, jack of spades. Jack of spades. Jack of spades. I didn't say it out loud. I didn't even whisper in nobody's ears in here. There's 52 cards in the deck, church. 52. That means the odds are 1 in 52. Unless, you know, mathematically it's greater. Who knows? 1 in 52. He, I put the card back in the deck. <laughs> Shuffles them. They're all blank. <laughs> Cut the deck. I'm cutting the deck. I'm playing along. He holds the deck of cards out in front of me, and, he, and, a, my, and a card rises up out the middle of it. And I'm like, what? I'm watching his fingers. He ain't doing anything. There's no strings. I'm looking. I'm watching, trying to figure out the magic trick. The card rises up, and he goes, 
turns it around and he shows me. He goes, you see it? Is that your card? I said, it sure looks like it because they're all white. And he goes, you don't see the jack of spades right there? And I went. I, I, he go, and he goes, what's the matter, man? I said, dude, I think you're possessed by some evil spirits or something. <laughs> And I'm telling I don't know how he did that trick, but that was probably one of the coolest tricks I've ever seen because he was in my head. That was it, man, get away from me, dude. Now you're starting to scare me. <laughs> but I'm not going to lie to you. Some tricks I kind of figure out because I pay close attention. I'm trying to figure them out. But every time I see my friend Steve, it's not Steve. It's not Officer Kellogg. It's Steve the magician. Right. I'm like, dude, you got your magic tricks? Show me a trick. <laughs> I want to see a trick. You know what? People, we treat, we treat the Lord the same way. We want to see a magic trick. God, take away so-and-so's illness or we'll believe you're real. You know he's real. You can't manipulate God into answering your prayers like that. Prayer is an overflow, a natural overflow of the relationship you have with him. You have to, you have to give. Jesus has called you unto himself. If you are a, a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to grow in that. Grow beyond being a disciple and becoming a leader in some sort, some form or fashion. You're called to be more than a student. A friend of mine once told me, he said, I'm not trying to get too philosophical with you, Jose. He says, but you do know that your education is not for you, right? Because, you know, I, I got a master's degree. I'm proud of that. And he says, it's not for you, right? And I went, wow, it's not. Your education, your life experience, your knowledge that God has given you is for others. It is. You can give advice. It's not for you. So what are you doing with what God has given you? You're sitting on it? You're squandering it? We have a responsibility to move beyond that. And if you're doing it for prestige, remember, there's apostles you probably can't name. Nobody knows their occupation or their characteristics. Obscure people in the Bible that Jesus called. He didn't call them for nothing. But they're behind the scenes taking care of things that have to be taken care of. If you're in it for the limelight and all the hoopla, you're in it for the wrong reasons. If you're in it to watch the next m magic trick that Jesus pulls off, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Amen? So I want to leave you with these thoughts. Jesus contrasts between the earthly kingdom and the kingdom of God. He said, this is not the kingdom that you are going to be a part of. And I'm here to tell you, church, I say it every Sunday. I know not every Sunday, but if you're in it for that, you're in it for the wrong reasons. You're in it for the wrong reasons. So you could choose for yourself whom you're going to serve. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. So choose for yourself whom you'll serve. If you have a relationship with Christ, you're called to the next level. This church is committed to the process of making disciples and cultivating leaders. I want you to examine your own heart this morning as the praise team comes forward and I close this in prayer. I want you to examine your own heart and ask yourself, why are you here? Are you serving the King of Kings? Are you serving the Lord of Lords? Are you in it for you? Are you in it for the miracles, for the magic show? What are you in it for? Why are you here? Ask yourself that. Make a commitment today one way or the other. The Bible says it is better to make, not make a promise than to make it and break it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. It's true. I thank you, Lord, that it doesn't change. Father, I thank you that it is something we can build our lives upon. Father, I thank you that it is real, Lord. It's alive. And it cuts. Father, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Your word teaches that there's nothing new under the sun. And many of the motives of the people who were following Jesus then are still true today. We all have different motives. Your word teaches us, Father, that, that the heart is deceitful. Above all else, who can understand it? Our own heart leads us astray. We can't trust it. So Father, I pray that you would guide our hearts. Father, help us to examine ourselves. Are we sincere in our desire to serve you? Or are we in it for other reasons? Father, I pray that you would reveal our hearts to us, Lord. Show us what maybe we don't even know about ourselves. Father, give us the desire to serve you, Lord, honestly, earnestly, Lord. You've given us so much, Lord. Help us to use what you've given us for your glory, for your honor, and for your kingdom's sake, Lord. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move about this place, Lord, touching the hearts of each and every person that is here, Lord. I pray that you would prompt the response in their heart, Lord, 
either right there in their seat or right here at the altar, Lord, I'd be more than happy to pray with them, Father. But either way, I pray that you stir our hearts even now. Lord, we love you and we praise you, Lord, and we commit this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.